Welcome, welcome everyone to Perpetual Life. So glad to have you here and welcome everyone online who's joining us through the live streaming we are doing tonight. My name is Neil Vandery. It's my pleasure to be your officiator here this evening. And this evening we celebrate Bedford Day. We celebrate Dr. James Bedford as the first patient to be placed in cryostasis on January 12th, 1967. A few years ago, Ben Best suggested that we celebrate this day every day, every year, and thanks to him, we do. And we went to the mayor last year to ask him to give us a proclamation. And they do that uh, from time to time. Uh, mayor Josh Levy from Hollywood has done so for us. So uh, it is proclaimed as Bedford Day throughout Hollywood every January 12th. He has given us an update to the proclamation. I'd like to share that with you, our letter from uh, Mayor Josh Levy. And I'll read it to you for you here. Uh, Dear Mr. Vandry in the Church of Perpetual Life, on behalf of the Hollywood City Commission, it is a pleasure for me to convey our congratulations to you and the members of the Church of Perpetual Life as you gather to celebrate the 51st anniversary of James Bedford Day, January 12th, 2018. We recognize your dedication and leadership for the value of human life, health, and longevity. Best wishes to you and your congregation for continued success and many more years in the city of Hollywood. So that's a letter we got from uh, Mayor Levy, which is very nice. And I'd like to uh, read the proclamation he gave us uh, proclaiming January 12th as Bedford Day in Hollywood. Here's the proclamation from the city of Hollywood. In recognition of uh, Dr. James Bedford Day, January 12th, people of many faiths, nationalities, and creeds value human life, health, and longevity. And whereas, the members of the Church of Perpetual Life and longevity enthusiasts around the world view cryonic suspension as a method of extended emergency medicine. And whereas the first cryosuspended cryosuspension occurred on January 12th, 1967 of Dr. James Bedford, and this January 12th marks the last year, January 12th of 2017, marked the 50th anniversary of this historic event. And whereas in honor of the, his courage and forward thinking, the Church of Perpetual Life honors Dr. Bedford and the thousands of other patients and future patients of cryonics as they embark on a journey in the quest of cures to extend human lifespans. Now therefore, Josh Levy, Mayor of the City of Hollywood, Florida, and the Hollywood City Commission hereby proclaim January 12th as Dr. James Bedford Day in Hollywood. Signed by, Dr. Signed by uh, Mayor Josh Levy. So we're very proud and happy to have this uh, proclamation of Bedford Day. We must keep all cryonic patients in our memories and look to the day when we see them all reanimated and brought back to life. Uh, I'd like to share with you a NOVA video on the process of cryosuspension. Doug, if you'll cue up the video. This is a... a uh, a video from a series in Nova on PBS that aired a few couple of years ago, I believe, and it's uh, still pertinent information. So this will give you a little bit of a preview of how a cryosuspension works and a little bit of a uh, glimpse into the facility in Alcor. There's a, several facilities around the world. There's Alcor, there's uh, the Cryonics Institute, there's also here, right here in Miami, Osiris, <clears throat> and also there's a, the, the Oregon uh, Cryonics Organization. And uh, there's one starting in Australia. I understand that there's one in China. There may be a second one coming. And there is a Cryorus in Russia. So around the world, there are several organizations, whereas only uh, 50 years ago, there may have been one or two. Now, the, now they're, they're, they're growing. And the idea of chronic suspension is coming forward. How are you doing with that, Doug? OK. Let's watch the Nova video. Near the hot desert, just outside of Phoenix, Arizona, is a company called Alcor. Despite the high temperature outside, within, over 100 human bodies are being preserved at very low temperatures. Host David Pogue met with the president and CEO, Max Moore, to learn about the field of cryonics. So who's in this gallery here? These are some of our patients. We call them patients because we don't regard them as dead people. Their idea is that what we call death today is something of an arbitrary line. 
really it's today's doctors giving up and saying there's nothing more I can do for this person and I'm letting them go. What we're doing is we're saying let's not quit there, let's give the future a chance to bring these patients back. Moore doesn't promise he'll be able to bring any of his patients back, but he thinks the chances are pretty good. Already we're seeing the field of regenerative medicine just burgeoning. Uh, we're already starting to replace organs and grow organ parts. And I think within the next 20 years you're going to see some amazing developments. So pretty much any organ in the body will be replaceable, either with a biological one grown from our own tissue or perhaps a synthetic organ. After an Alcor member is declared legally dead, the patient is immediately placed in an ice bath. Then, the Alcor team restores respiration to make sure oxygen continues to flow to the brain until the body is cryopreserved. In fact, certain patients choose to preserve their heads alone. Ted Williams, the baseball star, is a famous Alcor neuropatient. But here's the part I don't get. Suppose medical science does advance as you hope, and in 75 years they can revive this decapitated head. You don't have a body anymore. Well, this is the way I look at it. I personally am a neuro member myself. I'm not taking along my body. My reasoning being that by the time I need this, my body's going to be a disaster area. So in my view, if you have the technology that can repair 100 billion damaged neurons, replacing this part is going to be pretty easy by comparison. <laughs> but we leave that choice to our members. So let me show you the patient care bay. Patient care bay. Yes, this is where we have currently 117 patients, the oldest being Professor James Bedford, who's pro preserved back in 1967. Wow! Oh my gosh, this so, is very sci-fi. It's not quite as sci-fi as in the movies where they always have a little frosty face behind a glass plate. Can't, <laughs> can't really do that, but here uh, in these larger jewelers we have uh, four whole body patients and we can also put five neuro patients in the central column. There's, there's people in those cans. That's right. The bodies are wrapped in a sleeping bag to protect the skin from direct exposure to liquid nitrogen. Each one is held in its own aluminum compartment within the can. So if we could see through these, we would see people just kind of like floating like this or? Uh, you'd see the, the aluminum pods and inside they're actually head, head down. So that head the, down? Yeah, so that the, uh, the head would be the last thing to be exposed. So are these heavily insulated? Are these basically giant thermoses? Exactly. Just room temperature, a little bit cool to the touch. Yep. That's the inside is extremely cold, minus 196 C, minus 320 Fahrenheit. I mean, you must get some strong reactions from people. You tell them what you do. Especially when they don't really understand it. They, they think there's some kind of strange, creepy thing where you're freezing people. Why would you do that? But once they understand that really it's an extension of critical care medicine, it's just us picking up at the point where today's medicine gives up on people, it makes a lot more sense. When they see patients in hospitals being taken down 10 degrees C to slow down metabolism while you do brain surgery, it starts to make sense. When they look at the research into organ cryopreservation, the goal being to actually build an organ bank and you know, keep a stock of organs rather than having to match one across the country very rapidly, it starts to make sense. It's certainly speculative, it's certainly not guaranteed, we're not sure if it's going to work, but it's not crazy, it's a shot, it gives you a chance. And as for Max Moore? You would live forever. I don't use the word forever because forever is a very long time. Uh, there may be the heat death of the universe, our sun might explode in a few billion years, who knows. But indefinite lifespan I'm talking about. Really changing death from being compulsory to making it an option. So you know, check back with me in a thousand years and ask me if I've had enough. Till then, more will be at Alcor. Well, at least his head will. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of what cryonics is. If you have any other, other interest in cryonics, we have literature just outside the sanctuary here on the cryonics table as well as downstairs. You're welcome to talk with me after the uh, service tonight. If you'd like to ask any questions, if you have any uh, requests of information, I'm happy to help you with that, or if you wish to give me a call. Uh, there's probably a half a dozen people that are members of this church that are cryonic, uh, signed up for cryonics, and maybe others. Not everyone is public about it. Uh, I am. But uh, obviously there are people who prefer not to be public about it. Um, and for that reason, th there are many uh, famous people who are signed up and who, or who have been uh, cryopreserved and uh, who are patients, but uh, it may not be known to the general population. On uh, January 25th, this fourth Thursday of this month, we have Dr. Aubrey de Grey coming to give us a presentation on age reversal. Dr. Aubrey de Grey is one of the top people in the whole world on age reversal, and he'll be coming here to speak. We're really looking forward to having him. Very excited to have 
uh, Aubrey coming. In February, we have Dr. Michael Rose, a professor from UC Irvine. In March, we have Dr. Bill Andrews, the CEO of Sierra Sciences. And in May, we have Dr. Jose Cordero. You may have remembered him. Anybody remember him from the Rad Festival? The Revolution, the Revolution. <laughs> and uh, then in June, we have a panel of speakers to discuss different diets. So that's our, our coming schedule. We have a schedule posted on those tables upstairs and downstairs if you'd like to get one or get a picture of one with your phone. So you'll have that. And if you're ever in doubt of what's going on, just check out the website. We typically keep that uh, updated on all of the things going on. I'd like to mention also on Saturdays here at Perpetual Life, we have Qigong. Uh, Jeff Smoley, would you stand or wave over here? Here's Jeff, and you can talk with him afterwards. He's, uh, he's donating his time to do instructions here for Qigong on Saturdays at 1.15. He's a Qigong master of 45 years training promoted by Dr. Zhao Peijin. Uh, he's a martial arts expert and a fourth degree black belt in traditional jiu-jitsu jiu as well as a U.S. Uh, Army veteran. So for more information, see Jeff about the Qigong op opportunities you have here at Perpetual Life. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. He is the uh, past president and CEO of the Cryonics Institute, which is the world's, one of the world's largest cryonics organizations. For nine years he was uh, past president between 2003 and 2012. Ben is a well-known activist in cryonics and life extension advocacy. He holds undergraduate degrees in pharmacy from the University of British Columbia and physics and computing sciences and finance from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. Ben is also a certified and professional registered parliamentarian by the National Association of Parliamentarians and he's currently the treasurer here on the board of directors at the Church of Perpetual Life. He spends much of his time traveling the world to attend medical and health conferences toward the ultimate goal of ending aging and expanding and extending human life. So let's all give a great welcome to our very own Mr. Ben Best. Ben. Now if you have any questions for him regarding his uh, talk, be sure you're welcome to ask him throughout the presentation, but know that at the end there'll be a more time to do a Q&A, so you'll have a chance afterwards as well. But if you're not sure what he's talking about, raise your hand, and if it's a brief question, he'll be happy to, to try to answer that. Ben, thank you for thank you. tonight. Yeah, I, I would prefer uh, uh, <clears throat> questions during my presentation to be for clarification purposes, and um, uh, 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 leave questions that, that would involve more detail or debate or discussion uh, for the end, just but if there's if something I say is unclear, then then uh, I welcome a question uh, on that uh, subject. Okay, so uh, this uh, the the presentation is basically about biotechnology, uh, biotechnologies. But uh, I'm starting out with uh, a discussion of uh, James Bedford, who was uh, preserved uh, uh, <clears throat> 51 years ago in 1967, and um, he's uh, he. He wrote to the father of cryonics and uh, saying that he was dying of liver cancer, and uh, he was uh, then he later preserved at the age of 73 on January 12, uh, 1967, and he's uh, currently in storage with Life Extension Foundation, and uh, he was uh, in dry ice for uh, six days before transfer, and uh, he was a pro psychology professor. Uh, he authored uh, seven books on vocational training. He enjoyed travel, including uh, going on an African safari and Amazon and uh, driving to Alaska and extensive travels in Europe. Uh, that shows the team at work uh, uh, preserving Dr. Bedford, and these were the people who, who were involved in that. And actually, the, the, this, the, the story of his preservation was to be in Time magazine. Uh, in the beginning of February '67, but uh, the the, the uh, Apollo astronauts, uh, there was you know the uh, Apollo um, <clears throat> ex explosion of the of the uh, uh, became a more important uh, story, and and so uh, that was pulled from the Life magazine. But uh, some of the original issues were distributed in the uh, southeast. So um, we're talking about biotechnology controversies, and cryonics is a biotechnology. So I'm just going to address some of the co the controversial issues. Uh, first of all, the, the people are concerned it would cause overpopulation, but um, 
the rate of population growth is slowed and is negative in developed countries. Um, and uh, also uh, life extension, especially cryonics, uh, the, the amount of people involved is, would make a neg negligible contribution uh, compared to the, uh, to the contribution to uh, over, overpopulation by reproduction. There's only a few, a few hundred people in storage in, in, uh, in cryonics. And uh, anyway, if man can uh, reside in space, there will be vast uh, energy and material resources available. Um, uh, many people are, are afraid of revival in a world of strangers, but uh, th I think there will be at least, at least as many lovable and likable people in the future as are in the present, and getting to know others with current cryonics arrangements will help you uh, assure that you will know people, and also uh, it's a good idea to encourage loved ones to make cryonics arrangements so uh, you can be re reunited with them in the future. Um, and the future shock, uh, people are afraid of, uh, of um, coming into a, a strange world. And, uh, but actually, uh, handicapped per persons once had a much harder life than, uh, than, than they do today. Technology has made their lives much simpler. And uh, uh, technology would, would exist, uh, would assist in the future to an even greater extent, uh, helping with the adaptation. And uh, th there's a complaint that uh, cryonics is very expensive. And uh, it's, uh, we're only storing a few hundred people now, so that is somewhat expensive. But, and that, but a lot of that uh, capital is involved in facilities and staff and so forth. And uh, if many people had made, made cryonics arrangements, uh, there could be large economies of scale because the liquid nitrogen cost was, is, is less than $100 per year currently. And most people fund cryonics with life insurance policies. It isn't like people have a, a lot of money in cash to pay for this. Uh, the, the costs can range from twenty-eight thousand dollars to to uh, to oh, you know two hundred thousand dollars. So there's a wide range of options, but a lot of people don't have uh, this kind of money. But uh, anyway, um, and uh, there's a there's a concern. Some people think that cryonics is a money-making racket. And there have been people. I have seen uh, money make, money hungry people uh, thinking that they can uh, that uh, cryonics is for rich people and that they can they can exploit that. But uh, these people don't tend to remain. Uh, I I know the people involved in the cryonics organizations, and they're almost all all highly motivated to to uh, to save themselves, save their own lives, and save the lives of their of their loved ones. And the cryonics organizations are are organized in such a way as to as to ensure that the board of directors are, are composed of such people. And some people think it's uh, conflicting with religion, but uh, medicine doesn't con conflict with religion. And if you think of cryonics as a life extending medicine, then th there's no, th the conflict isn't there. And uh, it can only extend life anyway. It's not a, it's not a, doesn't guarantee or immortality. Uh, <clears throat> even if you're, if you're cryonically preserved and aging is eliminated, a death by accident or murder, or murder is probably going to be inevitable sometime in the future. So we just, I, I'm looking for cryonics to extend life uh, hundreds or thousands of years, but, but uh, not, uh, I don't, not expecting immortality. So uh, into a more general topic of biotechnology, the, the, the controversies uh, uh, about biotechnology tend to be focused on religion or government, uh, and government can involve both politics and lawsuits, uh, ethics, and, and also just aesthetics. So um, let's start, up, start with, I'm, I'm going to be focused on, uh, on uh, a lot of uh, uh, fertilization issues and stem cell issues. So just to talk about the process of fertilization, um, uh, normally uh, uh, after, uh, after people uh, <clears throat> uh, copulate uh, the uh, the um, an egg cell is released from from the ovary into the fallopian tube and and the most aggressive uh, uh, sperm and the most viable most active uh, will will reunite with the egg up here uh, uh, shortly after the or close to where the the egg has uh, exited from the ovary and then uh, uh, the, the the division of the 
of the fertilized egg begins as the egg is, trans is going down the oviduct, the fallopian tube, and uh, so we get two cells and then uh, many cells and then we get this uh, blastocyst that forms right about the time that, that the egg is uh, implanted into the uterus. But uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the, the major biotechnology is in vitro fertilization, uh, so-called test tube babies in which the, the sperm and the ova are united outside of the woman's body. And uh, uh <clears throat> so that was preceded by artificial uh, insemination, which was original, which was before we had in vitro fertilization. And, uh, um, but then in 1978, uh, the first uh, test tube baby was born to a woman who had blocked oviducts and, and required this procedure. And uh, so in the USA currently, the in vitro fertilization will cost from 12,000 to 30,000. And uh, the woman re receives drugs to stimulate ovulation and produce several eggs. And then uh, they're fertilized. And the extra e <coughs> embryos would be stored in liquid nitrogen. Now, nearly half of women under age 35 <coughs> become pregnant with one uh, IVF treatment. But uh, it, it drops to less than 10% after they've been uh, at age 40. So. Uh, so these extra embryos can then be brought out of liquid nitrogen and, and, and a second attempt made or a third attempt even. Uh, and uh, so uh, anyway, by this process, more than five million babies have been born. And uh, it costs hundreds or thousands of dollars a year to store these embryos. And uh, the extra, the, the unused eggs or embryos uh, can be donated to unfurled couples, but about half of them are just end up being destroyed. And uh, for those who believe that life begins at conception, destroying an embryo uh, is murder. Um, so the Roman Catholic Church, among uh, many other uh, Christian Christians, oppose in vitro fertilization. Uh, they think it's unnatural for one thing, and, and also they, they, they certainly don't like the idea that the embryos are being destroyed. And uh, some Orthodox Jews oppose the masturbation that's needed. Uh, that's the, how you get the sperm for in vitro fertilization. And uh, Turkey, China, and Indonesia will only allow uh, IVF for married couples. Costa Rica has complete, completely banned IVF until 2015. And as, but Spain, Sweden, and the USA will allow, allow gays and singles to, to uh, take advantage of in vitro fertilization. And uh, there have been lawsuits, separated cu couples uh, may dispute the ownership of these frozen embryos, uh, you know, that being stored for future use. And um, they, the, uh, this ethicist has uh, said that no one should be forced to be a parent, commenting on the lawsuits. So in one case, one parent wanting to use the embryo uh, to, uh, to create a baby and the other parent not wanting to. And the, the embryo is in storage. So there's uh, also fertility, <coughs> uh, tourism, so-called. Uh, uh, a lot of people go to Israel. Uh, you know, if, if, if IVF is illegal in their country, they might want to go to Israel, and Israel has the highest rate of in vitro fertilization in any country. And it's also the uh, leading destination for, uh, anyway, as they say, and, and it's also, but the United States is also a popular destination for IVF treatment. But Americans uh, will go to Mexico because uh, of the expense uh, of IVF in the United States. It only costs about half as much. And uh, Denmark has a well-developed uh, sperm donation program. Um, another controversy has to do with pre-implantation pre pre genetic diagnosis. Now, because the, the, this uh, embryo is being created outside of the body, uh, it means you can ex ex examine the embryo for any genetic defects or abnormalities. And uh, so if, if you discover the embryo, uh, uh, you, you've examined the embryo and you discover it has some genetic disease like cystic fibrosis or Huntington disease or something, uh, you can just uh, uh, get rid of that embryo and, and make another one. And um, it, it can be used for uh, immune matching uh, it, it, sometimes uh, 
sometimes uh, children are born to to uh, to save another sibling uh, uh, to, to have a closely matching um, immune system type and uh, it's sometimes it's been used for sex selection but it's illegal in many countries to use it for sex selection uh, examine the embryo and only accept one sex or the other male or female uh, but that's illegal in Australia Canada the UK Germany many other countries but it's uh, and, and any kind of PDF, even for genetic testing, even for finding uh, abnormalities or, uh, and screening for abnormalities, it's completely illegal in Austria, uh, Ireland, and a number of other countries. And uh, there's, there's, there's some concern about using uh, um, this, these procedures for uh, genetic designer babies, genetically engineering a child that has desirable features. Um, and then there's also the mitochondrial replacement. Uh, so uh, the, <clears throat> such, the, our mitochondria are the powerhouses in our cells, and they have DNA uh, as well. And uh, there are many, uh, uh, d <clears throat> many people with diseased uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA. And uh, uh, so uh, in this case, you, you take the nucleus uh, from a, a potential mother and you implant it in the egg of a woman uh, who has healthy mitochondria, and then the egg is fertilized, and so the child can be said to have three parents. Uh, uh, when the, in a sense, the, they're getting the mitochondria and the egg from from one parent, or the mitochondria from from one parent, and the the uh, the uh, the female side of the of the um, zygote from another parent, and the uh, the male side of the zygote from a third parent, and uh, so. Um, as with many of these bi biotechnologies, uh, um, scientists and physicians are accused of playing God. And um, <clears throat> there's also uh, gestational sur surrogacy because uh, um, the IVF embryo doesn't need to actually be implanted in the uterus of the real mother. They can be, a surrogate mother can be used. And uh, surrogacy can be altruistic or Commercial, in other words, you either a, a woman will either volunteer to be a, a, a surrogate to, for altruistic reasons for for another couple, and or, or or charge money. So both both those forms of surrogacy are illegal in France, Finland, Italy, uh, and many states, including New York and Michigan. But they're both they're both forms are legal in Greece, Russia, Iran, uh, Ukraine. California and the state of Georgia, both the state of Georgia and the uh, country of Georgia. But um, I, I underline Russia and Iran because we often think of these countries as being uh, so totalitarian and, and uh, dictatorial and it's surprising that they would allow such a controversial procedure, uh, both commercial and, and, um, and altruistic in their countries. So in, here in Florida, the, the, we, the, it's only allowed surrogacy for legally married heterosexual cu couples. Uh, uh, the gay, uh, it's only certain states that allow gay uh, um, couples to, to, um, to, practice, to use a woman for surrogacy. And uh, India is the leading, the world leader in commercial surrogacy. More, more people go to India because, well, it's inexpensive and available and, and uh, the women there are willing to uh, to um, to offer their uh, their wombs for uh, for rent. So cloning uh, <coughs> a clone is a, a genetically <coughs> identical organism. <coughs> so you can literally say that a twin is a clone, but uh, it, it, we don't normally think about uh, twins as being cloned. Um, so the the first mammalian clone uh, it was Dolly the sheep. Now um, Dolly was created in 1996. Dolly was created to to uh, uh, to uh, <clears throat> make a, a sheep that could produce a milk containing a, a, a protein needed by human babies. So a lot of work went into creating Dolly, and it would have been take been a lot of work to create similar sheep. Uh, uh, it would be much much easier to 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 clone Dolly than to than to try to uh, make another another um, or, or clone Dolly's mother rather than make a, make a, uh, uh, another one. Anyway, the, the, a great deal of effort was put into doing that. So 
uh, a nucleus of a of a breast a breast tissue cell was taken from from the transgenic sheep, the sheep that produced this uh, human milk, and it was implanted in the egg of a normal sheep, which had the nucleus removed. Now this procedure uh, usually failed. It had to be attempted over 400 times before a, a single clone succeeded. So it's, uh, you know, they, they took a lot of effort and persistence. And um, I, I might mention uh, uh, the, 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 um, the sheep was named Dolly because of the, of the use of uh, breast tissue uh, after Dolly Parton. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> as I say, named after Dolly Parton, and, and this is just showing the procedure of the, the, the this was the, uh, the, the transgenic sheep, uh, the, it was the, uh, the nucleus of this sheep uh, was be, were being donated and it was taken and added to the, to the, uh, to the um, cell of this, uh, uh, of this from another sheep. And then uh, th this, uh, by uh, uh, electrical pulse and starvation, uh, this, uh, th this, uh, mammary, this mammary cell actually became, inside, once, uh, once the nucleus was inside this donated cell from another sheep, uh, it, it developed into a, a blastocyst and eventually into Dolly the sheep. So I guess that's just another another sign of another uh, illustration of the same procedure. So uh, actually, since Dolly, there you know lots of uh, lots of uh, <coughs> uh, mammals have been uh, cloned: camel, cat, cow, uh, and uh, actually this, uh, including this uh, this ibex, this extinct uh, species. Uh, they, they they actually took they they had they had uh, stored uh, tissue from this uh, extent, extend, uh, extinct species and, um, and then cloned it. And, and, but uh, the, died, the animal died seven minutes after birth. As I mentioned with the dolly, they had to do it 400 times before they got it to work once. So in this case, uh, you know, they, the procedure was improved enough so that they don't, they, you know, they don't get as many failures, but it's still not well perfected. And uh, many extent or near expense species are being held in the San Diego Zoo and, and hope that there'll be future cloning. And even the Harvard geneticist George Church, he wants to uh, clone, reproductively clone woolly mammals and Neanderthals. And um, they, they, have the, they have the gene, the, the genome uh, for, for these, uh, for mammoths and Neanderthals. So um, anyway, that's a work in progress. So <clears throat> the word cloning, as they say, is the creation of genetically individual, identical individuals. But um, there's, there's uh, the, the word is somewhat confusing. There, there's reproductive cloning, which is what we had in the case of, uh, of uh, Dolly the sheep, uh, where um, Dolly's mother uh, uh, had a surrogate mother. Another, another sheep donated the egg, and, 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 uh, and, and um, the, the Dolly was developed inside. And uh, then there's therapeutic cloning, where you actually uh, just take, uh, use the uh, embryo for, to uh, make uh, stem cells. So um, uh, the reproductive cloning type of cloning can give you a live birth, but the therapeutic, the embryos just provide uh, stem cells, stem cells for research and therapy. So reproductive cloning of humans is illegal in almost every country in the world except the United States. Uh, but but the, 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 the arguments that they had in the Senate, they, they just confused the distinction between therapeutic and reproductive. Uh, so it ended up, they ended up getting no legislation. But at least 15 states, including Florida, uh, banned uh, reproductive cloning of humans. And um, most scientists oppose human uh, reproductive cloning, uh, mainly the first uh, reason is because uh, uh, it's it's just too dangerous. As I say, we, we've, we, you know, it's gotten a lot better, more efficient, uh, but uh, but too often that you know it, it just can't be done safely. That you get many defective, you get de many defective offspring, and uh, it's fine when you're when you're doing a sheep. You, you know, you can you you just look for the good one, but you don't want to be creating a lot of defective humans, and. Um, uh, as far as from from a moral point of view, apart from, for, aside from the scientific argument, uh, uh, 
Pope Benedict, for example, uh, uh, condemned it as a, uh, the idea of, of human reproductive cloning as a grave offense to the dignity of all people and all that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> stem cells, um, now we normally have stem cells, all of us have stem cells in our body that are working all the time. Uh, the, the, what you call somatic stem cells, because like uh, all the red blood cells in our body are replaced every four months and skin cells tend to be replaced monthly and uh, in our intestine it's every few days. So, so all these cells are being replenished in our body all the time and they heal wounds. And, uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, we have stem cells, these, these somatic stem cells. So uh, there's no controversy about somatic stem cells. And uh, the, the, they'll be particular to the tissues in which they reside. The, the stem cells that replace the red blood cells are distinct from the stem cells that replace uh, the skin and the intestinal lining. So they're, they're, they're very uh, specific to, to one tissue. Now, <clears throat> we have embryonic stem cells. Now, these, are, these can give rise to, they're not so specific as somatic cells. They can give rise to, to, to any tissue. And these, these are the ones derived, this is what, we, what, what I <clears throat> referred to when I was talking about therapeutic cloning, was uh, taking, an, taking an embryo, removing these embryonic stem cells, and, and using them to, to, uh, to, pr to produce any tissue. And they have the, a potential for regenerative medicine in, to regenerate any, any tissue, not just uh, specific tissues. And then there's induced pluripotent stem cells. And these are uh, induced from uh, just any, bu bu buds, any body cells. For example, I, I mentioned that uh, d uh, the <coughs> dolly was produced from a skin cell. And, uh, so, and but these 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 uh, can be induced by uh, by a, a number of protein factors, uh, but but they're uh, the, they, the procedure isn't as efficient. They're, they're more vulnerable to cancer than than uh, um, than the embryonic stem cells. So oh, there's the picture again, and and uh, uh, just to show you the uh, it's it's um, w w at the implantation stage uh, uh, the the it's when this, uh, the embryo is at this stage, you just, uh, the embryonic stem cells get removed from this, from, from here. And then uh, uh, normally, uh, historically, the, the, the embryo was then destroyed. Uh, so if you believe, conception believes uh, the wife begins at conception, then th that would be uh, murder. But anyway, <clears throat> um, it, it's more recently, uh, actually, it, it's, it's been become technically possible to remove some of these embryonic stem cells without killing the embryo. So in that case, uh, no one would think of it as murder. Anyway, um, th this is a, uh, showing more detail. It's uh, close to being implanted. And these are the cells that, uh, what, that are called embryonic stem cells, and that's, that's where the embryonic stem cells are taken from. And uh, the, as far as the in induced, uh, these are the the uh, protein factors that have been used to uh, induce uh, skin cells of various kinds or, uh, to, uh, uh, or, or any kind of uh, body tissue cell uh, to induce them to, to become pluripotent, as pluripotent as embryonic stem cells, so they can become different tissue types. <clears throat> now, um, um, so um, the, why, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to use stem cells? Uh, it's because, you know, when, when people are transplanting organs or tissues uh, from one person to another, uh, you know, some organ fails and you need a new heart transplant or a new liver transplant, uh, then the, the, the immune system tends to react to that. It doesn't like it. and You require drugs to suppress the immune system. Uh, and uh, but if you had a pluripotent stem cell that you, that you took from yourself and you need an organ transplant, then there wouldn't be a, that uh, immune response. You wouldn't need these immune suppressant drugs. And uh, uh, so these uh, these pluripotent stem cells that would have a lot of potential to, to to cure many diseases, including diabetes and Alzheimer's disease and so forth. Um, but uh, Especially the the uh, pluripotent stem cells have been very uh, uh, difficult to to make work. It, it's only 
only one dis d disease has been treated, a, a case of macular de degeneration, and it cost a million dollars to do it in one year uh, of preparation. And this, was, this, act, this experiment was actually done by the guy who discovered uh, induced pluripotent stem cells in Japan. Anyway, so he's, he's sort of given up and doing this in the near future until the technology is improved. Uh, embryonic stem cells are far more efficient and less likely uh, and, uh, th than pluripotent stem cells, but uh, th there's more political opposition to uh, using them. And um, <clears throat> uh, another thing that, that stem cells could be do, the, it, it might be possible to activate stem cells in women's ovaries to allow them to, uh, to bear children at later ages or even delay uh, and avoid health problems associated with menopause, including heart disease, osteoporosis, cancer, etc. And stem cells could be used to grow replacement organs, such as a heart, a liver, a cancer, a lung, for people who would otherwise die of an organ, organ failure. So organ, the, the, and you, you wouldn't have this immune reaction when you're creating an organ yourself from your own, your own uh, stem cells. Uh, and you wouldn't require all these immuno, immune suppressant drugs and so forth, and, and also wouldn't be, uh, tend to be rejected. So a lot of people don't like the idea of using embryonic stem cells. Uh, uh, many Christians are totally opposed to this practice, and, but uh, uh, Jews actually, uh, and mo most Jews uh, actually encourage the practice, and Israel's a major uh, center for research. Um, so, um, that creation of embryonic stem cells is illegal in, in these countries, Austria, France, Portugal, Ireland, and a bunch of others. And, but uh, it's legal in uh, Finland, Greece, um, Sweden, and the UK. So there's a wide difference in the legality. Now here in the United States in 2001, uh, George Bush uh, tried to compromise from permitting federal funding only for existing cell lines that had already been created. So. So um, in this case, uh, you're not, you know, you don't want to be using existing cell lines. You wouldn't be actually doing it anyway. The, um, but uh, th there was no restriction on on private companies creating uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, I, now there's, <clears throat> the, Peter Nygaard is is a founded this uh, Nygaard clothing brand, and he's he has a net worth of uh, nearly a billion dollars. And uh, he's the only person in the world who's actually created an embryonic stem cell line from the nucleus of one of his own stem skin cells and the egg of a woman. And he injects, he injects these embryonic stem cells into himself, and he's uh, induced the Bahamas government to enact laws to allow uh, embryonic stem cell research uh, at the uh, research foundation that he wants to create in the Bahamas. So... Um, <coughs> So uh, I guess a, a key key point of condition here, contention here is does does person who begin uh, when the sperm and egg unite, and uh, so ancient civilizations uh, understood intercourse resulted in conception, but virgin birth was regarded as a sign of divinity. So Krishna, Zoroaster, Constantine, Nero, Jesus Christ, and many others claimed to to have had a virgin birth. <clears throat> Now, Hippocrates, uh, the ancient physician, believed that um, a male semen and a female factor were required for conception. Uh, both factors were required, but Aristotle thought that the womb was only a place where the semen uh, could develop into a baby. So Aristotle thought the semen was where it was, had all the potential. Uh, and then uh, for over 2,000 years, the Catholic Church has uh, sometimes equated abortion at any stage of pregnancy with murder, but other times it's not. So it's, it's, the science was so poorly understood that the Catholic Church really uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't really take a position. It wasn't really understood. But Islam and Judaism have, hold, have held that, that the, uh, the soul only enters the, uh, the embryo several weeks after conception. So it wasn't until 1677 the sperm cells were first discovered. And then the, the, the egg cells weren't, weren't discovered until quite, quite a few years later, 1827. And it was only in 1876 that it was proven that the fusion of an egg and a sperm was, uh, uh, was, was what gave rise to an embryo in a human being. And 
<clears throat> so with with all this all these many years of uh, uh, of regarding uh, uh, this this policy of life beginning at conception, the scientific basis of that it wasn't even understood until 1876. That's when that's when we, we figured out uh, what conception was all about. <clears throat> and uh, but a, a fertilized egg can result in twins 14 days after conception. So if you can have a twin, is is not the same person. So uh, it, so how can you say? Anyway, you've got two persons, uh, po the possibility of two persons up to 14 days. So um, it, it, it makes it makes a difficult argument for for a, a person at the beginning at conception. Um, now, Roe versus Wade uh, was a, 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 an anti-abortion or, or a, 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 a ruling dealing with federal U.S. law dealing with abortion. And it made it unconstitutional for any state to prohibit abortion during the first three months of pregnancy. So they're sort of saying personhood, it might seem to say that they're saying personhood doesn't begin until after three months of pregnancy, but uh, they denied saying that that's what they were doing. They, they said they, they weren't taking a position in which life begins. I don't see how they can justify that, but anyway, that's what they were saying. And uh, they say that it was based on woman's rights uh, but after after three months, the, the rights of the fetus become more paramount to the rights of the woman. So it's it's a it's a tricky argument. Um, anyway, the, the 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 Supreme Court clarified this later to say uh, uh, the, the, the cutoff point was a, <clears throat> a fetus being able to survive outside the womb. And uh, but you know technology can make survival outside the womb uh, uh, possibly. Uh, uh, any time after conception in the future. Um, so gene therapy <clears throat> is a modification of genes by <clears throat> delivering engineered cells to genes to to cells, usually using a <clears throat> a safe virus. A virus is not going to cause infection. Uh, viruses are very good at getting into cells, and they're very good at taking genes into cells. And uh, so if you if you got a virus that's not going to cause infection, then um, that that would be a good 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 uh, way to use uh, to use gene therapy. And it's especially sought to uh, treat uh, these uh, diseases of single mutations like cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, sickle cell anemia. And actually, in in uh, June 2010, a London baby dying of cancer was the first person cured by gene therapy. Uh, the, the baby was given white blood cells engineered to rec recognize the, the cancer cells. By 20, <clears throat> 2014, at least 20 children uh, born with an immune deficiency disease have been cured with gene therapy. These are the so-called bubble, bubble babies that, that don't have a functioning immune system. And uh, this, kind, this, uh, this kind of gene therapy uh, was approved in, for use in Europe in uh, 2016. And um, so the, the, I guess uh, <clears throat> the, the controversy is, uh, is that the gene therapy could be used to alter uh, sperm and uh, egg cells with genetic diseases before a child is con conceived. Uh, but uh, so that would be the most effective gene therapy rather than having to give it to, to somebody who already has all these, you know, to actually be able to concentrate on uh, the sperm and egg or embryo rather than have to wait until uh, until um, you have an adult with you know all the cells in your body that need to be fixed. Uh, but uh, so, but gene line <clears throat> again we have different different uh, na different countries having different laws and it's illegal in Austria, Canada, Germany, Israel, Sweden. The, the USA has no specific restrictions against germline therapy, but uh, the FDA need, needs to be involved and approve all therapies. Um, <clears throat> in theory, gene, uh, gene therapy could uh, be used to provide humans with genes that would eliminate vulnerability to HIV virus. People who have this uh, <clears throat> this gene <clears throat> altered uh, 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 actually do not get HIV, cannot get AIDS, the AIDS virus, and uh, uh, and um, so it would be nice uh, to have to have all of us having this this gene modification. Uh, to use gene therapy to have that, or 
or uh, centenarians have special genes that allow them to live long and healthy lives. People 100 years old and over. Uh, it would be nice to be able to distribute those genes to all of us so we could all live uh, like a, as old a, to a healthy old age like the centenarians. And um, <clears throat> it would be, uh, you know, there, there are other gene, genetic modifications we could, we could, uh, the, we could take the genes from rotifers and and allow us to to uh, tolerate radiation. And that could make uh, <clears throat> space travel uh, uh, safer. And then genes could be used to make larger muscles, breasts, penises, or eliminate baldness. There's lots of uh, possibilities there. Um, now, genetic engineering refers to uh, altering the genes of, uh, of uh, um, different organisms. And it can mean inserting genes from one species to another. That's uh, the literal meaning of, of, a, of a GMO. But it can also mean just altering the genes of, of a species using some of these technologies where you directly engineer the, the DNA rather than insert the genes of another species. And um, more control, uh, it gives more control uh, means of altering organisms other than random mutation or selective breeding. And uh, the genetically modified organism foods are the most con controversial area, but uh, that's, that's only one, uh, GMOs are, are only one kind of genetic engineering and GMO foods are only one kind of GMO. So conventional breeding, <coughs> Is, is you know nat mutations happen naturally, and uh, and uh, um, so um, e with natural selection uh, as an evolution, uh, the, the, you have mutations, and then you and then the, the fittest survive, and so so the so the there's there's an alteration in in the DNA just by by evolu by that. Now breeding is is where humans get involved, and uh, so mutations are still occurring naturally, but humans are selecting uh, uh, the plants or animals for, for the traits that they want. So thousands of years of selected uh, breeding was able to convert uh, these uh, wolves into, uh, into breeds of dogs. Uh, uh, and uh, most cattle breeding uh, currently occurs by insertion of, of uh, sperm into selected bulls. Uh, 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 the, the best bulls are, are uh, and the best cows are, are used, and 90% uh, of cows become pregnant by artificial insemination in industrial, uh, industrialized current countries. So this is uh, conventional breeding techniques, and we're, we're really altering the gene pool uh, by these pro this process. Um, and uh, almost all modern plants are very different from, from what they were in, in the ancient world. Ancient tomatoes were, were tiny and yellow, and Cabbage was originally too poisonous to eat. Uh, you can say that just many foods are like that. Ancient ancient wheat had small speeds, so small seeds, long stalks, stalks low yield, and seed dispersal. So by it's by selective breeding uh, that, that that we have these uh, the modern most of, most of the modern fruits and vegetables we have today. Uh, you know the the, the uh, seedless grapes. Seedless grapes and or and oranges and and watermelons are, are not not natural. Uh, you know they have to be. There's there's a lot of engineering that goes, but they aren't called GMO because uh, because uh, they they don't produce offspring because they don't have any seeds. Uh, and, and, but they are, they are called GMO because because they aren't uh, they aren't produced by the the the, the, the technologies that are called GMO. So another I, I talked about. There's mutational breeding, and so that's creating. So um, <clears throat> normally, normally breeding occurs by um, uh, ra random occurrence of mutations, which you know creates, modifies the the the, the plant or the animal or the species in some way, and uh, um, we can accelerate that process by causing causing a more uh, causing more. Uh, uh, mutations to occur by using radiation or or, chem or chemical agents, and uh, it, it's many uh, foods have been created by mutational breeding, uh, and making them uh, uh, sweeter or more colorful or disease resistant and so forth. Uh, ruby grapefruit was produced by exposing grapefruit buds to 
to a new neutron radiation. So they just bombarded these, this grapefruit with all this radiation and, and uh, just looked for the, looked for the ones that, that had the desirable qualities, the grapefruit, and then, uh, and then uh, breed those. And uh, so um, the, these are not classified as GMOs, and they can, they can be said to be, you can grow ruby red grapefruit organically, and they aren't called uh, or GMOs. Um, so uh, transgenic laboratory animals, uh, uh, these uh, GMOs have been uh, allowed the creation of animals that display many human diseases. And uh, so they, they're useful for, for studying these diseases and finding therapies. Um, so uh, glowfish, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fish that glows. Uh, the, the, the gene for the glowing was taken from jellyfish that naturally glow. And then they put it in, glow, in, in this uh, glowfish, and they become aquarium pets that you know entertain because they glow. Um, GMO mosquitoes were released in the Cayman Islands of Brazil uh, to reduce the disease-carrying mosquitoes, 80, 80 to 90 percent, compared to to 30 to, to the reduction of disease of these mosquitoes, 30 to 60 percent by pesticides uh, that was used in Florida. So. Um, Theoretically, uh, mosquitoes can be re-engineered to resist organisms that cause malaria, dengue virus, yellow fever, Zika virus, and so forth. Or a, a gene drive uh, with genetic engineering could uh, eradicate mosquitoes completely. Um, now, nearly all the insulin that's used by diabetics today come from GMO bacteria. Now, so that's, that's bacteria that, that have the human gene, the human gene uh, for for making insulin, uh, it was placed in the bacteria, and uh, before the, before they had bacteria producing insulin, they had to take the insulin from pigs and cows and so forth, and, and it wasn't pure human insulin. Uh, it was only similar. It wasn't wasn't as good as what we're getting now today by using these GMO bacteria, and uh, bacteria have also been uh, modified. Uh, to produce lots of other pro valuable proteins, such as antiviral interferons, clot, the clot-busting tissue plasminogen a uh, activator, human hemoglobin, uh, this erythropoietin to stimulate red blood cell growth, interleukins or anti uh, uh, interleukins prevent uh, allergic responses, and so forth. So, uh, genetically, GMO organisms have actually uh, been, uh, and, and bacteria have actually been powerhouses for producing a lot of a lot of the proteins that uh, are useful for human health now um, GMO foods foods there's a lot of controversy around GMO foods uh, so uh, GMO foods are considered safety by nearly all scientists including and uh, including the support of the American Medical Association the US uh, National Academy of Sciences Royal Academy of Medicine and the World Health Organization and millions of people have eaten GMO foods with no harmful effect. But contrary to what scientists think, or what most scientists believe, the majority of Americans believe that, that GMO foods are unsafe. And, and actually, they believe no amount of safety tests and testing would ever be sufficient to convince these GMO act. Well, I, th I think no amount of safety testing would ever be sufficient to convince anti-GMO activists that, are, that GMOs are safe. So this is basically just a fear of technology, uh, as far as I can see, and, and uh, I think it's a I think it's a very unfortunate fear because I think the potential for for GMO uh, for using genetics to modify our foods uh, would, would be uh, of enormous benefit, and it already has been of enormous benefit, uh, but people are just afraid of it. They're just afraid of this technology. Um, so. Um, an example, uh, golden rice uh, is a GMO that, would, that produces, uh, a, it's, it's a GMO, genetically modified rice, that will produce pro-vitamin A. And it could save millions of lives of children as well as preventing blindness. And uh, rice is a staple food for about 50% of Asian countries. A, a, cup, of a, a cup of the two, 2005 variety of golden rice per day could prevent death and blindness. But uh, anti-GMO activists supported by Gene Greenpeace uh, trampled a golden rice test field in the Philippines and trashed a testing laboratory in Australia. Uh, 
anti-GMO activism has prevented this uh, golden rice to, be, to become available to, to all these uh, people in the world who could have been saved uh, by, uh, by uh, saved from blindness and, and death. And um, human milk from transgenic uh, goats containing human milk producing genes could save hundreds of, of thousands of children from death by diarrhea. <clears throat> human milk contains thousands times more antibacterial lysozyme enzyme than livestock milk. So, so why not modify the livestock to, to produce human milk instead of the, uh, uh, the produce, they produce the milk they're producing that isn't, isn't human compatible? Now, between 1997 and 2010, the, the, the number of children with peanut allergies has tripled, uh, uh, probably because of, uh, of um, uh, all of the um, omega-6 uh, fatty acids we're consuming in margarine and so forth. In any case, that's speculation. But anyway, if we could genetically engineer peanuts to remove the allergenic proteins, uh, then these children would need, these children with peanut allergies would be a lot safer. But once again, uh, the opposition to, to genetically modified peanuts uh, would, would be very small, would be very strong. And uh, the genetic there's two ways of doing a, um, making a GMO food. You can either use uh, this, uh, G this very uh, efficient CRISPR technology, which is very precise gene editing, uh, and uh, as opposed to uh, the introducing of uh, the genes into another organism, which is uh, an example of the insulin-producing bacteria. So soybean oil contains uh, <clears throat> high levels of unhealthy trans fats, which you may have heard is associated with, with uh, heart disease. And gene editing could replace these uh, trans fats with uh, the kind of healthy fat found in olive oil. And uh, gene editing, editing produce plant foods that can be more productive and more disease resistant. <clears throat> the potato fungus, fungus caused millions of deaths in Ireland in the 19th century. But genetically engineered potatoes are resistant, can be resistant to fungus. And uh, cold into sweetening potatoes caused 15% of potatoes to be discarded every year. But with gene editing, this waste could be prevented. Um, uh, in viral pig uh, was a kind of pig genetically modified organism. Pigs normally, um, uh, they, they don't, they, they produce a lot of phosphorus uh, that they create but from, from, uh, from phytate, uh, which is in, uh, in foods. And uh, pig manure normally pollutes, pollutes uh, streams and rivers poisoning algae and fish. And the pig, the genetically engineered pig, had less than half the phosphorus in their manure. But it was euthanized in, in uh, 2012 due to the action of anti-GMO activists. Aqua Advantage salmon grew to full size less than half than the normal growth time. And uh, this could reduce uh, pollution from importing salmon. But anti-GMO activists caused whole foods, safely, et cetera, to refuse to sell the salmon. Um, organ, tr organ transplant. Most deaths due to uh, most deaths are uh, are due to a failure of a single organ: the heart, liver, kidney, etc. And this could be uh, prevented by transplanting an organ. But only 10% of those needing an organ transplant actually get one. Uh, well, one of the problems is you know you have to just recover a transplanted organ from a, from a body, and usually so people die suddenly. Uh, are, they are not, are not at a convenient location. And it's hard to store the organs very efficiently. And uh, transplantation also, once you get a, some, an organ from somebody else, you have to take these toxic immune suppressive drugs. But if we, if we had GMO pigs, they could be a source of transplantable organs. The, pi the pigs could be genetically modified to match the immune system of the organ re recipient. Um, so Leon Cass was uh, chairman of President Bush's Council on Bioethics from 2001 to 2005. I mentioned that President Bush made this uh, compromise on, on the use of stem cells, uh, uh, embryonic stem cells, somebody's phone. And anyway, he was, he was an opponent of stem cell research and uh, he guided uh, President Bush's policy. And uh, he, he actually was against life extension uh, the whole idea of extending people's lives. He said, death is really, he believed that uh, death death uh, gives meaning to life. 
So he said that revulsion is a gut level ethical guide that w to, to warning us against cannibalism and, and uh, incest. But uh, different people have different revulsions. Uh, uh, some people have revulsion to interracial marriage, homosexuality, death, the abilities of age-related diseases, body surgery, etc. So uh, I have a revulsion to Leonard Cass. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, maybe we agree on on one point. So that's it. So are there questions? If there are questions, I'd like to go ahead and bring the microphone to you, Jeff. Dolly the sheep that was cloned, uh, how long did that sheep live, or is it still living? Well, no, uh, she died uh, six years after being born. Uh, but uh, actually, it was, it, was, it was due to, the cause of death was not related to, to being cloned. And, and the, the cloned animals that are produced now, they live just as long as, as, as any other animal. Animals are being cloned now. Oh sure, yeah. I mentioned dogs and you know dogs and and sheep okay. and yeah and, and and to produce, you know, produce uh, human milk and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Over here, Other questions. And the reason we're using the microphone is that we have people who are live streaming. We'd like them to hear the questions. Michael. The movie. The movie Multiplicity is a good example of why cloning human beings, they don't always get it right. Have you seen the movie? No, I haven't seen that movie, but I... Michael Keaton? Yeah. Multiplicity is a comedy with Michael Keaton back about uh, 10, 15 years ago. It's uh, where he gets cloned and he has several of them all uh, interacting. It's a funny movie. Yeah, well, I guess some some people were some people were were thinking about uh, the danger of dictators cloning themselves and so forth, Hitler or something. But actually, uh, that wouldn't wouldn't be very smart because the person most likely to overthrow you as a dictator is your clone. So it would be a lot smarter to to uh, clone a bunch of docile uh, 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 docile uh, subjects rather than try to clone yourself if you're a dictator. <laughs> ben, we have a question from Andrew. Yeah, I was wondering about glyphosate, the miracle Grow, Monsanto. Do you have any comments about the GMO? What, what um, is it? He's asking about the uh, GMO in uh, Monsanto, uh, gly 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 glyphosate. It's the active ingredient miracle Grow, Monsanto. Oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with that. So the basic point of all this was to promote genetic engineering, is that correct? So what basic point of what? And let, let, me, let me kind of speak to that, Ben. Uh, she's asking if the basic point of tonight's lecture was to promote cloning and, uh, and other, other things that were discussed. Um, the, and, and let me come forward to this one item. It's, it's important to note that uh, different members of the Church of Perpetual Life have different ideas and different uh, concepts on this. What Ben spoke of tonight were his ideas, and he brings forth his concepts. And we come here and meet together, and, and the, it's important for us to listen to each other and, and hear each other's ideas and uh, perceptions of things and concepts. Uh, I, I think that uh, Richard may have different ideas on GMO than Ben does. Uh, he's also a board member. And so we have an open forum for discussing these so that we can teach each other and learn from each other on this uh, idea. Ben. Well, I, I understand that the vast majority of the American public are, are afraid of GMOs, are afraid of genetic engineering. Uh, they, they just don't, and they don't feel like any amount of safety testing would be adequate. And I feel like there's an enormous potential, so I'm in the minority. Um, but I'm not in the minority with the majority of scientists. It's the American public, there's just a vast divide between how the American public perceives these technologies and how the vast majority of the scientific community perceives them. As I say, the American uh, Medical Association, the American uh, Society for Advancement of Science and so forth, and the Royal Society, all these organizations uh, recognize the great benefit of GMO foods and, uh, and the vast majority of the public, uh, the American public uh, is afraid and in European public. Thank you, Ben. Other questions? Back in here. All right. I'll be back to you. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. So if you're freezing a brain, was the point that eventually, years and years, they'll be able to manufacture a body to go with it? 
Yes, that's the point. The, the, I guess uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the idea is, uh, um, I, I'm not saying exactly how it would be done, but uh, we, we grew bodies, every one of us in this room uh, grew bodies at one point. And uh, if you have, uh, with, with uh, stem cells and, and the right kind of scaffolding, you could, you could populate these uh, uh, scaffolds with stem cells uh, to re recreate all the organs and tissues. Now, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very far from, any, from current technical capabilities, but the people who, who, who uh, engage in this practice uh, believe that this will be technically possible one of these days. So there are two groups of people who are being cryonically suspended, those who are whole body and those who are, simple, are, are, are brain or head only. Uh, there are different members of the church here. Some are brain only and some are full body. Uh, and we'd be happy to discuss details on that. And if you want more information on that, as I say, there's a, a table in the outer rooms that have for more information on cryonics. And of course, Ben wasn't really talking too much about cryonics tonight, but more on technology controversies. Question here. Uh, GMO seeds uh, contain uh, Roundup. Do GMO seeds contain Roundup, Ben? Um, well, uh, th there's a, there's a herbicide. The, the, the idea is that uh, you know many many plants, many uh, crops are lost uh, due to due to weeds, and uh, and the, the use of the if you make a genetic a genetic uh, uh, Gen genetically modify a plant so that it's resistant to herbicides and you can kill the weeds and save the plants. That's what Roundup is all about. All right, here's a question. Well, no, the, 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 it's, it's, it's not, uh, I, don't, I don't think the herbicide is killing the people. It's, it's uh, anyway. There's a lot of people who have different opinions on that. So here's a question from Rich. Yes, uh, I have two things. Uh, one is uh, you didn't mention cord blood, and I wondered uh, how that fit. As for a source of stem cells? Yeah. Uh, and how they were different. Well, it's, it's possible, but uh, cord blood, it, it's in limited supply, and it's controversial. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I guess cord, cord blood is saved for, for future use for the, for, for the infant. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's less immune. It has causes less immune reactions than other kinds of stem cells. So, uh, uh, so it's it, it, it's just a, it's not you don't get it in large quantities. And and uh, as I say, it's it's best suited for the for the baby that you've taken it from uh, the, 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 rather than others. But it, the the immune responses to to cord blood and mesenchymal stem cells is less than than to other kinds of stem cells. And then my other comment is, uh, has to do with glyphosate and some of the research that they did at Dow, Dow uh, Chemical. And that was that uh, the glyphosate actually replaces the glycine molecule in your proteins and things like that. And so it's, uh, it actually makes your collagen weaker and things like that, so you I, 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 I doubt that, but I, I, I should have should have uh, they, they uh, should have gone over that subject a bit more before preparing for this lecture. But I, I was just was looking at so many other subjects. Sure, they did put radioactive tags on it and found that it was incorporated in proteins. Okay. I'd like to recommend Rich if you could share some of this data with uh, Ben. I'm sure he would appreciate well, it. Well, no, I can I can research it myself. Okay. I, I just I just didn't didn't pay attention to that particular. Sure. I should have expected that that kind of question. Other questions for Ben? Okay. To speak just to the Roundup issue, I, I personally don't use it and don't like it. Uh, I've heard I've seen some things on it, but I'd like to know more about that as well. Yes. Here's a, here, here you go, Ben. One question is, what about the power outages uh, as far as cryonics go? The what? Power outages in the event of a cryonics uh, facility. Yeah, power, no, power that's, uh, I, I, that's, uh, these patients are stored in liquid nitrogen and they, they can go for, you know, without power, there can be power outage for weeks and weeks and, and the liquid nitrogen is, uh, only boils off at a slow rate. To address that also, uh, most of the organizations also have backup generators in the event that power is not being brought back in time that they need it. But it's the, the use of the liquid nitrogen that's very, uh, very cold, very, very... Uh, yeah, but, but, but you know, you're not cooling with electricity. You're cooling with 
with liquid nitrogen and 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 but but you know James Bedford has been has been in storage for 51 years uh, so uh, there, and there hasn't been an issue with you know, they haven't even come close to uh, to running out of liquid nitrogen or during p power failure okay. Marshall we all know that uh, fruits no longer are, are being produced seedless but yet we can produce fruits so are you saying in the future that the sperm and the egg will become obsolete and we will produce people through cloning? Uh, that's, that's speculation. I, I didn't think I certainly didn't say that. I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, you know, it's possible. I mean, it, you know, that, the, the, these possibilities have been raised, as I say, almost everyone, all scientists and, and governments in the world oppose human cloning just because it's so dangerous with present technology. But, you know, there are thoughts that, you know, uh, less, you know, men men have become obsolete because women can just t uh, clone clone a baby and and carry the womb, or or a, a man can can uh, make a clone of himself and have it have it placed in in a surrogate mother, and uh, uh, you know the, the well, people have these kinds of fantasies, but as I say, uh, the the, te the technology isn't there and the laws are. Are against it. I'm, I'm not saying I advocate this practice, but uh, I guess if people, you know, people, uh, if they lose a child or something like that, and they would like a clone of that child, or, or uh, the, uh, the, you know, beloved pet, uh, you know, the, the, the I think misplicity was a cloning, a cloned uh, uh, copy, uh, the cl a clone of a dog uh, uh, that, that was uh, the, the John Sterling paid a million dollars to to have done uh, just because he, he loved his dog so much and he wanted a clone and uh, there's been copycats of you know cl people cloning their cats to have an identical cat we have one more question back here from Andrew yes I read an article about uh, Tony Robbins he's the, the guru for uh, positive thinking he has a machine he paid a lot of money for fruit with liquid nitrogen he zaps himself like takes a quick bath for 15 minutes. I don't know exactly how long it is. Uh, is that dangerous to do long term? Does that, can that ruin your cells? I don't know anything about that subject. Referring to cryotherapy, uh, there's a, a place here in southern Florida that has that, and a lot of the athletes are using it now. But um, it's, it's super, super cold. Uh, actually, David, I think you've visited. Uh, can you speak to that? David London visited the cryotherapy place here in South Florida. Yeah, I've had the experience of having, uh, from down in Key Biscayne all the way up near Jupiter to having three minute sessions of being in liquid nitrogen, sort of, where it's a very ex exhilarating experience and uh, been available in Europe for 20 years. It, it, it charges you up. You, don't, you can't stay in more than three minutes and the number of athletes have used it and uh, it's it's an interesting experience it's to to try thank you david all right well you know there's going to be a chance after our, our talk tonight to be able to speak with ben directly downstairs let's give a big round of applause for ben for pre giving us his presentation ben, thank you you know here at the church of perpetual life as i mentioned we don't take any political um, agendas, we, but, uh, and we all have our own ideas. It's important for us to get together and discuss our ideas and uh, to, uh, to discuss the things that are, are coming our way. Uh, this is a, a very insightful presentation Ben has given us, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to mention again that um, this church is a science-based church, so the Church of Provincial Life is a place for people of all creeds to come together of all uh, religious views to come together with the one concept, with the sole concept of looking for unlimited lifespans. That's what we espouse here. It's a guiding principle of uh, perpetual life that indefinitely extended healthy lifespans are desirable and attainable. And we hold faith in future technologies and advancements of humanity to end aging. And we see that happening here at Perpetual Life. 
Again, on January 25th, we have Dr. Aubrey de Grey coming at 7 p.m. He'll be speaking and giving a presentation. Our doors will open at 6 o'clock. Uh, Dr. Aubrey de Grey is one of the head guys on, on age reversal worldwide. He's, he's world-renowned. He heads uh, the SENS organization, and we're so happy to have him coming. Uh, is, has anybody uh, here who's heard him speak in person before? Or maybe seen this one of his videos? He's done TED Talks and TEDx Talks. How many people here are here for the very first time at Perpetual Life? You're here at the church for the first time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Almost a dozen of you. Wonderful. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that maybe uh, some people told you about it. Uh, did you hear about it from uh, social media, or you received an email, or you, you got a text? Maybe your friends told you about it? All right. So I, I, what I'd like to do is encourage you, when you leave tonight, be sure to take one of these uh, little brochures about the church with you. Share with your friends and share with your family. Let them know uh, what we're doing here and, and what we're about. We're all about health and longevity. We want you to live a healthy, long, long, long life. We are on your side on that. On that. Now, as I said, Aubrey de Grey is going to be speaking. He gave a TED Talk, and uh, this was from a year or so ago. Doug, let's go ahead and show Aubrey de Grey's uh, TED Talk. Just, this is just a couple of minutes, a talk that Aubrey gave uh, not too long ago. And again, I say that um, I say that we ought to fight to actually uh, save some lives, and that's why I'm saying we need to wake up and act decisively. It turns out that we can. Um, for the past 15 years, I've been working on essentially this uh, dissection of the problem: uh, the types of damage that accumulate in the human body can be classified into only seven major categories, which I'm listing on the left here. Of course, I don't have a chance to go through them today because I've only got another two minutes and 50 seconds. Um, but the, uh, what you really need to know is that for each of those seven types of damage, there is a very plausible and viable approach to fixing it. You've heard of stem cell therapy. That's the way to fix one of those types of damage, the one at the top, loss of cells, which is just cells dying and not being automatically replaced by cell division. It seems very clear now that this categorization, this classification really is actually exhaustive. There's not some category number eight lurking out there waiting to be discovered. Furthermore, this is gaining traction among very elite and authoritative scientists. Uh, this is here is just a picture of our research advisory board, 25 extremely prominent and um, world-leading specialists in their various areas who are very much signed up for this damage repair approach. Uh, furthermore, other people are beginning at this point to actually uh, reinvent this idea and pretend it's original. This paper came out three years ago, and it's getting cited roughly once every two days by other papers, so it's really um, uh, saying something that people believe in, and it's identical to what I just told you. This is, they divided aging into nine categories rather than seven, but it's essentially the same idea. Each of them, they have a, a particular repair approach. So that's all nice. Um, now, the question then is, um, what progress are we making? Well, the good news is quite a lot. Of course, there is progress worldwide by various scientists and laboratories around the world. Um, there's also a charity, a foundation called Sense Research Foundation, which was crea created around this idea, and of which I'm the chief science officer. This is a selection of the papers that we've published over the past few years, demonstrating our progress. So it's happening. It's re we're really getting there. It's got, there's a long way to go, though. I mean, if you get this book, which I wrote a few years ago, and which actually was translated into German, it's called Niemals Alt in German, and you can get it. Um, uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's detailed. There's a lot of material here, because the fact is, aging of the human body is really, really complicated. And fixing it is not going to happen overnight. But we are making more and more progress. As time goes on, we're going to get there. But the question is, how soon? The question is how soon. We actually have to remember how important this problem is, coming back to the, what I said at the beginning of the talk. This problem, the problem of aging, kills 100,000 people every day. That's roughly two-thirds of all deaths. It's about 70% of all deaths worldwide. In the industrialized world, it's about 90% of all deaths are caused by the ill health of old age. That's quite bad. Dr. Robert Gray, you're going to be here on uh, January 25th, the fourth Thursday here in January. Uh, just a note, in February, we'll be meeting on the fourth Saturday with Dr. Rose coming. 
So our chef has prepared a special meal for you downstairs of salmon and chicken. You have the opportunity to speak with Ben directly downstairs as he'll be with us. And if you have any questions of me on cryonics or about the Church of Perpetual Life, I'd be very happy to meet with you and, and talk with you about that. Thanks for coming this evening. And uh, don't forget, you can watch this on YouTube in about 35 minutes. It's going to be live on our YouTube channel. Thank you. It's called Forever Young. <laughs>